Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Redefine Expectations webinar series that is meant to highlight the amazing work that our young people are doing um, in their different professions. Tonight's webinar is on the future of governance and advocacy. My name is Amanda Ndati Chukura, and I am the sector lead for the Governance uh, Network here at African Leadership Academy. Today, we have an extraordinary group of alumni who are setting the bar on what governance and advocacy should look like. And I sure hope that you will enjoy the conversation that we're about to have and engage in it as well uh, by asking us questions. And while we're on the topic of questions, should you want to ask any question um, in the webinar, please go ahead and ask the question by using the Q&A box at the very bottom of the screen. Should you want to vote for a question that has already been asked, feel free to actually use the voting option and to highlight that question uh, for us to see. Also, if you want to chat among yourselves, you're also welcome to do so. Um, you can use the chat box at the bottom there as well. Um, perhaps let me start by just giving you a brief uh, description of the amazing panelists that we have. The first person is Ida Ndiaye. Ida is from Senegal. She is a public policy manager at Facebook, leading tech policy initiatives and government relations for the technology giant across countries in French-speaking and Portuguese-speaking Africa. Ida has a master's degree in public policy, which she obtained from Oxford University. Wow. Welcome, Ida. The second person that we have is Tiasa Mutunke. Tiasa is from Kenya and she's a conservation activist and founder of Teens for Wildlife, an advocacy and mentorship platform campaigning against um, poaching and illegal wildlife trade. Since launching her campaign as a 15 year old student, Tiasa, also known as the Wildlife Warrior, has made it her life's mission to be part of the generation that prevents our animals from going extinct. Welcome, Piazza. Last but certainly not the least is Eddie Ndugo. He is an award-winning activist, humanitarian, and public intellectual. He has overcome several personal challenges to become a global advocate for people living with disabilities. Today, he is one of the United Nations Secretary General's global advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals. Wow. Welcome, Eddie. I am sure excited because I know these panelists and I've had really great conversations with them over the last couple of months and I'm just super, super psyched for this conversation. So maybe to kick us all off, um, I will start the conversation with Emma Theophilus. Um, she is the recently appointed Deputy uh, Minister for ICT in Namibia, and she was appointed this at the age of 23. And she got a lot of feedback and backlash because a lot of people were debating on whether she has the necessary expertise and experience to be leading um, such, a, such an important and prominent position at her age. So my question will start by going to Ida and maybe hearing your thoughts on what the role of youth is in government and informing policy. Thanks so much, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Very excited to be part of this panel uh, with very uh, inspiring co-Ele Alams. I mean, thank you for that question. It, it's it's really an, an important one. And if we think about the, the meaning of government to its bare bone without uh, any of its complexity, it's generally just a group of people or, or 
who are governing or, or putting together the, the, the rules for, for, le for leading an organized community. Uh, and if we think that, um, and we know that 50, over 50% of Africans are less than 25, and uh, then it's essential to have some representation of the voices of youth in government. Um, and so when we see a 23 year old minister, uh, that is just something I would say is normal. And actually it's something that I would say um, actually has exist uh, not the fact that of being minister has existed but the fact that young people have been involved in informing policies have existed in throughout our own our own history you were telling about the you, you you were just narrating the amazing bio of eddie and chester and a lot of their work is actually informing policy right and changing policy making and even for our countries as well whether it has been independence movement or now movement towards democracy a lot of those policies around who should be in power who shouldn't be in power have been led by young people in the street and mm. so and i think we forget that and and perhaps what being minister at 20 three uh, shows is that it's important to have the voices of young people not only on the street but really at the table and give them a very meaningful seat also as well at the table when they can uh, where, where they can meaningfully contribute um, and the last thing I will say on that as well is just the fact that, um, and I heard in your question um, as well, it's a critique that a lot of people get when you see a young people in a leadership position, the first question people ask are, is that person experienced enough? Have they like, uh, do they have the skills and the expertise? We don't ask that when a 50 or 55 year old is being nominated in a position. I'll share a, a story to make it a bit more personal. When I was first uh, asked by my manager to lead the Francophone and Lusophone region in Africa, uh, I was shocked. The first thing I said was, don't you think I'm too young for that? And thinking back, it was the worst first question to say when your manager gives you new responsibilities. Don't. So to anyone listening, Listening, don't do that but really what she said is something that stuck with me very um, throughout my career and throughout the years I've been at Facebook is that while the CEO of this company when I, is not even 35 a lot of all the VPs and the um, and the leaders are actually not even in their 30s yet so what the tech sector has done really well is that it has really dismantled this notion that age is a barrier to leadership or that age means no experience or no expertise the reality of it is that experience and expertise comes with practice. If you practice being a leader many, many hours, you will become a better leader. Uh, if you uh, spend your time working on a specific issue, no matter how old or how young you are, you will become an expert in that issue. And, and so for me, it's important to, force, to first stopping those criticism that because she's 23, she's not uh, necessarily uh, qualified. Let's look at what she's done. And and if she started working since she was 13 on some of these issues, then she might be more qualified than people who are 50. And the second bit is that young people have been informing policies and it's now to have them, at, to give them a meaningful seat at the table. Thank you very much, Ida, for that. Uh, very true, I totally agree. Uh, and maybe just to hear um, your thoughts on this, Tiasa, I mean, you're a young advocate, um, and I want to hear from your, you know, from you on what your thoughts are on this topic. Um, yeah, thank you, Ms. Amanda. And yeah, just, I want to say a big thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm really excited to be with Edward and Ida and this I'm super, super excited, so thank you. Um, but just to echo on what Ida said is, I think it's very important that um, the representation of us young people is, we are we are at the seat of the table. I mean, working in the conservation sector, I have asked, people have asked me like, what are you doing? Like, aren't you so young? You're very young, do you know what you're doing? And stuff like that. And it's, I always say, um, it doesn't matter how young you are, not how old you are, it's how young you are. Like no matter how young you are, you can make a change and you can make a difference. And understanding that it is important for we young people. I mean, I have looked at other young people like Lupita. She's making amazing changes in her space. And, and I want to be that person for the next 10 year old Kenyan girl or the South African girl who is like, just yes, is making a difference in wildlife sector. I can do it in the arts. I can do it in theater. I can do it in engineering. Um, and so, I think it's very important that finally we're no longer asking for permission to be in these spaces. We're owning it and taking ownership of these spaces. It's not about, oh, um, do you know what you're doing? I think it, everything is a learning experience and taking that opportunity to, as you go, as we grow older, 
we are learning new things and so um experience is a big thing and and yeah i just Ida has said basically what i was thinking but yeah just understanding that we we know what we're doing and we do want to be in these spaces of policy changes Mm, mm. We do want to be in these places of policy changes. So true, Tia. So thank you so much for that. I'd like to shift us a little bit um, in focus, but still talking around the area of advocacy. And this one goes to you, um, Eddie. And um, I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts because it would be very remiss of us to talk about youth um, in policy without talking about um, the current movement uh, on Black Lives Matter and how it just all started, but where we are right now with youth leading protests and uh, demanding for change um, for marginalized people, minorities. And I want to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, what is the role of youth in these movements and what are your general thoughts um, on the Black Lives Matter movement. For sure. Um, so, you know, I'll start by echoing what my fellow panelists have been saying. I think in keeping with the theme of the series, we need to redefine the expectations we ourselves have of what young people can and, 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 and are doing. Um, and I think that the Black Lives Matter movement um, demonstrates how the rest of the world is catching up to a moment that young people themselves have been setting. Um, the same is true for the climate justice movement. The same is true for the movement for gender equity and the Me Too movement. All of these movements that we um, have been, that all of these movements that we are grappling with have been sparked and catalyzed uh, by the ingenuity, by the frustration of young people themselves. Um, I think that we are um, in the midst of a global reckoning. Um, I think that uh, it's no coincidence that the connection between the pandemic, the deepening economic uh, recession, um, and racial inequality, all of these things are deeply connected because the same communities who are disproportionately affected by the pandemic are the same communities affected by the environmental and ecological collapse. And these are the same communities that are bearing the brunt of racial injustice and racial inequality. Black and brown people in both the global North and the global South um, are bearing witness to very deeply entrenched inequality. So I think the Black Lives Matter movement is showing us that uh, institutionalized racism uh, is not just uh, apparent uh, in the criminal justice system, but is apparent in all facets of life. The fact that uh, black and brown people are disproportionately affected uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic tells us uh, that that is a function of racism. That's a function of institutional racism. Uh, the fact that we don't have access to equitable healthcare co coverage is a function of racism. Um, the fact that we are on the front lines doing the work um, of uh, ensuring that everybody else is healthy is a function of the kinds of economic opportunities that are accorded uh, to black and brown people. So I think that the Black Lives Matter movement is really inviting all of us to think deeply about the question of racial injustice and inequality and how that intersects with the with the big public policy questions of the day uh, because of course they're in they, they're all interrelated um, and so i think that this is the biggest issue on the global agenda right now um, as it should be very true um eddie i i totally agree with you. It should be at the forefront. Uh, and I'm just really, really happy that it is gaining some traction. And we've seen some forms of reform um, in different countries where uh, policies have been passed uh, that will hopefully change the dynamics um, of how people have been treated for a very long time. And I think that the conversation needs to continue to be had. Um, so maybe while we're still talking about how um, COVID has disproportionately um, affected, um, you know, 
particular uh, groups of people and minorities. Um, we could also talk a bit more about how governments are actually handling um, the pandemic. And I want to hear from you, Ida, because you work quite a bit with governments um, to see uh, what are your thoughts on how the different African um, governments have been handling the, um, the situation? Um, thanks, Amanda, and really echoing the important words that Eddie was saying, how the Black Lives Matter movement was and is still about inequality and, and social justice uh, in all of its form, but also how it, it has even allowed us, I think, as an African continent, at least I'm seeing it in, young, in youth movement online, to think about how do we think ourselves as Black Africans and what it, what it means to be Black in the continent. So it's really, it's been very powerful to see that, 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 that global reckoning that, that Eddie was talking about. Um, talking about uh, the COVID-19 response and government strategies around it, it's an interesting it's an interesting question because when the when the uh, pandemic started uh, and Europe was underwater, uh, I remember very vividly the amount of articles that were predicting the doom in the African continent. Right, so the the the, the narrative was very much: look, Italy is going down, the UK look like they're not doing very well. Even the prime minister got it. There's no hope for Africa. And 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 I won't lie, there was a huge pride in seeing that um, that our, our, our countries, and again, it's hard to talk about Africa and all the countries in general because there's so much diversity in the continent. So please forgive me for that simplification, but at least generally what we can say is that uh, our most leaders in the African continent have really taken um, a very proactive approach and a very, uh, I, I, I would say, reasonable approach towards COVID-19 with shelter in places um, uh, measures and for me working in the tech sector very uh, more specifically I was very happy and heartened to see how, how much government wanted to use tech as part of the solutions right so whether it was around uh, developing new platform for cash transfer for informal workers who, 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 work, who weren't able to work anymore or whether it was around using whatsapp chat boots or in any other type of um, uh, social media or digital platform to communicate that was that that, that was quite Quite heartening to see. Uh, that being said, I think also I, it would be a disservice to just say the, the, the response have been an outstanding success, right? We are actually, the reality of it is that many countries in the continent haven't yet reached peak, right? So the number of cases are increasing and because um, the economic reality of the continent means that we can't be confined as long as other countries have been confined, uh, what we're seeing is, is government have loosened the confinement measures and cases are, are rising. I would say um, so far the the response have been quite optimistic in that we've seen a different type of Africa than the mainstream has was portraying. So that's very good. But the the reality of it that this is not a sprint. So it wasn't that we you know on March, April, June we did well. Now we can all forget about COVID nineteen and move on with our lives. The reality of it is that the disease will be retired up until twenty. 21 at least. And so this is this will be really a test for African government for sustainability now and for making sure that we're able to adopt measures that um, that make sense for the realities of, of every single country. Also make sure that countries can come together when it makes sense to trade between each other because we can't rely as much as to global networks as we used to do in the past, but also um, to ensure that that, that, that our, our, our leaders also are accountable to the to the population regarding their their response. And, and I'm quite positive as well and optimistic, at least from a tech sector perspective of the opportunities of tech helping African governments in, 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 in this journey. Thank you so much for that, um, Ida. Um, and I do, I do agree with you that there has been some level of proactivity that has definitely shown that there is hope and that uh, with the right nudge, uh, they can actually be reforms um, and governments can, uh, you know, uh, pitch up and show up. Um, so I, I definitely agree, um, notwithstanding the challenges, of course. Um, I just want to shift this again, because I'd really want the audience to get to know some of the specific work that you all are doing in your uh, different spaces. So I would like to start with um, Eddie and just talk talking about um, your organization, Beyond Zero, 
And I know that when we last spoke about it, I just fell in love with the whole concept. Um, and I thought to myself, this is what we need to be doing more of. Can you share briefly about that um, as well as how you think organizations like that can really um, promote impact across the continent? Sure. So um, if we were to quantify um, our place in the world as people from marginalized and neglected segments of society, we can think about our place in the world as sort of at negative 10 in the sense that we still um, grapple with deeply entrenched inequality and uh, a lack of access uh, to uh, the bare minimum of, of what is constitutes of what constitutes a dignified life. Um, and what I've noticed is, that the aspiration that policymakers have for our lives tends to be capped at zero, right? So it's all about compliance. It's all about the very basic building blocks, right? So as somebody with a physical disability who uses a wheelchair, who moves through the world as a disabled person, we only ever think about dignity in the form of a ramp. Um, so we equate a ramp with accessibility. We equate the attainment of um, a baseline as the attainment of dignity, right? And I, as somebody in the development uh, world, um, you know, we count people who live on $3 a day as no longer living in extreme poverty, right? So we go from $1 to $3 and then suddenly when COVID hits, and 500 million people are plunged into extreme poverty. We all clutch our pearls and we wonder, oh, wow, why, why is it that so many people um, are at risk for poverty? Well, why was $3 counted in our global tally of, 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 of progress, right? So this idea is, is about going beyond the minimum threshold. So beyond zero is an invitation. It's a philosophy to get the world to move um, beyond embracing these very basic ideals that we hold um, for people who uh, navigate through the world um, from a place of disadvantage and a place um, of, of, of marginalization. And to answer your question about why I think that's important is because I think we need to raise the level of ambition, frankly speaking. I think we are now having a conversation about building back better from the rubble of the COVID-19 pandemic. What does that mean? How do we ensure that we, that we uh, raise uh, the floor uh, in terms of social protection so that people are not as uh, vulnerable uh, to the vicissitudes of injustice and inequality um, and can live lives uh, that are dignified, right? So I think that this is an opportunity to reimagine public policy beyond the minimum threshold of uh, compliance, ticking a box, um, and counting things that should not be counted, um, that we need to go beyond that. And so it's, 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 a pro it's an organization that aims to raise a level of ambition. Thank you so much for that, um, Eddie. And I'm sure um, the audience here listening will definitely want to follow up on that with you and just learn more about it and see how they can actually um, get involved. Uh, such a lovely initiative. Um, Tiasa, let me just come to you now. Um, you know, at a young age, you have started this um, movement uh, on conservation um, and wildlife. And I'm just really curious on, um, you know, where that started, but also how you would uh, recommend that we advocate for um, issues that are not necessarily necessarily always at the front line, like conservation, um, and from your opinion, you know, what that looks like. Um, thank you, Ms. Amanda. Um, okay, so I started my movement, Teens for Wildlife, in 2015, which is a space for young people, African youth, to come together to come up with different ideas on how we can protect our wildlife. So this is through um, education, because I believe that once you teach someone about something, they, they learn to love it and you do anything to protect what you love. Um, and so the overall goal is to protect our wildlife, which is our heritage and our culture. And I feel like there has been that disconnect because 
we have, as you said, other things that have come at the forefront, but wildlife is such an important thing because it's part of our culture, our heritage. We have, you know, our surnames, Nglovu, which means elephant, um, and, and, and we have cultures picking up different characteristics. I want to be brave like the lion, the Maasai, the bravery and all that. But when it comes to protecting the animals itself, there seems to be some, somewhere there's a miss. And, and I learned that it's to do with information and, and many young people are just not informed about how fast we're losing our wildlife. Like we lose 96 elephants every day in Africa. How is that, how is that allowed? We have only 20,000 lions on the continent. And you know, this is meant to be the, I don't, I don't like saying king of the jungle, but like this is, this is where our lions are, the heart of, of, the, of, of the continent. Um, and I always say, animals are Africans too. I'm an African because I am I'm African of blood and soil. The elephant was born on this continent and the blood that runs in its veins, Africa. The same for the giraffe, same for the antelope and all the likes, but we don't seem to have a seat at the table about things, to con things about wildlife. Why is it that we're not having spaces talking about them? And so Teens for Wildlife, we've become that platform to reach to many young people. Our focus is on African youth because we are the future, because this is going to be um, my future. My children's children need to know about these am amazing things, this amazing heritage that has been kept in the shadows and not at the forefront. Um, and I think getting to understand that many people my age don't know about it. And for example, back home in Kenya, I when I adopted a baby elephant, my friends were like, oh, so the elephant is in your backyard. Like, <laughs> it's, it's things like that. They're like, oh, you didn't even know that we have an elephant orphanage in Kenya. Kenya is the only country in the world that has a national park in the capital city, but we don't take, you know, we don't take advantage to go see these wonderful wildlife spaces and and wildlands and take appreciation for it but that's just because of the lack of information that people don't know wildlife conservation sector has been painted to be the white man's thing or white man's sector and so um just being the catalyst to open spaces for people like me who, who look like me and are my age um and saying that yeah i can be a conservationist and i am a woman and i am black and I am young and yes I am going to own this space and and be the voice for these animals um mm -hmm. and so yeah it's been a wonderful experience because through um like for example here at ALA many of my friends are like oh my gosh what can I help what can I do to help like oh I, I learned that you love animals so when I went back home to Senegal I went to you know the wildlife sanctuary and conservation center because i was like oh if tessa can do this this is pretty cool and so from there there's been that love and be like oh my gosh i must protect these animals from my children and and just to be proud to say that as an african i was part of the movement that helped stop poaching that helped um, um talk to people from china vietnam and saying that we are not going to allow for you guys to be killing our animals for a, a, for a toothpick you know mm -hmm. we can't be having such we can't be having such things going on and and that creating that space have i've had very many different people come up with different ideas on how we can better our continent as a whole and, and create better wildlife spaces for our children yeah. thank you so much uh tiasa um whew, i mean you're already calling us to order uh and we're owning spaces and i think you know what it is happening um you know just to wrap up this uh because i'm cognizant of time just to wrap up this set, this part of the the webinar um i'll just go to ida and ask her to briefly um talk a bit about something that i found fascinating when we last spoke and you you know you mentioned that business and the business sector has um a very big part to play in governance particularly the public sector um i want to hear you know what would you say is the role of business in government? Um, and share your thoughts on that. Thank you, Amanda. It's very hard to follow after Eddie and Chessa's very transformative visions and very transformative work for the continent. Um, 
I'll speak about a bit about my work and and the and which is exactly your question. What is the role of business in uh, in policy making? Which is perhaps um, a bit of the um, the murky space of of policy making. I'll try to to summarize it in a very brief way. In that. Um, one thing we don't often we don't realize unless you are in the governance or the policy sector is that policy is a very contested place. Uh, um, and what what I mean by that is that when a, when you have a specific policy, let's say um, a policy around like like wildlife conservation or the policy uh, around how we are treating people living with disabilities in the society, often we don't ask why. <laughs> So why does those policy exist? And when you ask why, then you realize that there's a whole range of advocate that the policymaker or the politician had to had to be accountable to. There's the electorate, the voters, because they want to remain at the they they want to be elected again, most probably. Or and there are the activists, right? The people who are loud and have influence and can change the opinions of the people who will vote for them. And then there's business. And in in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's something that I advocate a lot. We're not very. Um, I think there's still a lack of transparency around the role that business plays in actually shaping policy making. It's 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 various. It's different uh, from different industry to another. I will speak about the tech sector more specifically and the role that it plays. Today, what when you take the tech sector broadly and more specifically digital platforms like Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, uh, what you're seeing is that these platforms are almost offering a service that, um, that, that touches that directly governance. So I'll talk about elections and when you have elections and the, the role of digital platforms in terms of um, political parties making sure that their people know about their agenda, but also young people and the electorate generally uh, sh sharing their voices, but also other actors, right? Um, other foreign interests being interested in, in also shaping the outcome of a specific election. It happens all over the world. And so what we realized very quickly at Facebook is that we actually have to play the role of policymakers almost because there are no policies right now around digital elections and digital democracy. There are no policies right now around privacy or, I mean, and there are some actually on, on privacy. So there is one around um, in, the, in, in the EU, but in the African continent, only a couple of countries have policies around privacy uh, or even content regulation. So what to do when someone uh, posts something online that can have an effect in, in real life. And we've seen that over the past couple of days. And basically the role of business and public policy teams in business is exactly that. So some of us play the role of policymakers inside the company to say, well, our policies affect elections. These are the way we should be dealing with elections. These are our policies when it comes to ensuring that countries have free and fair elections. And at other times, it's really talking to policymakers to co-create a policy space where the business can thrive, but also that can benefit the countries. And that's where my work lies. It's really sitting at that intersection where we are trying to tell them, well, we need policies around connectivity and access to the internet. We need policies around privacy or we need policies around data governance. How do we work together to ensure that those policies make sense for businesses like us, but also for the global economy? So to say that um, businesses actually are like activists, advocates, and the electorate can play, play a key part in influencing the policy making process. Thank you very much, um, Ida, for that. I, I just thought to myself, I think we need to be more strategic about how we use uh, business in advocacy. And uh, for me, that is helpful, um, what you just shared. So I hope the, the audience is listening and taking notes. Um, okay, so we are going to move to the Q&A part of this discussion. And I would ask that the panelists be very brief so that we could try and get through some or most of the questions that have been um, asked here. So the first one, maybe let me throw it to you, Eddie. It says, how can young people find a way to make a difference? Seeing that it all starts with an individual, how would you advise that a young person starts? Is it true that they need connections? Well, uh, this year we are marking the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and um, I recently stumbled upon a poem that was written by the late Dr. Maya Angelou where she recited it on the 50th anniversary of the United Nations and I think about the last few lines where she said that we must confess that we are the possible, we are the miraculous, 
the true wonder of this world. That is when and only when we will come to it, the brave and startling truth. And so I think for anybody that wants to make a difference, the brave and startling mm -hmm. truth is that we ourselves are what we've been waiting for. Um, that, that, that we uh, need to agitate, we need to operate from the conviction that if we want to see the world be different, mm -hmm. then we ourselves need to embody that difference, right? Um, yeah. And so I think it really starts with your own conviction, your own sense of uh, direction, your own sense of uh, what you feel you have in order to change the world. Um, and being insistent on that, right? In, in, insisting um, that you uh, have a seat at the table and that you demand it for yourself. Um, so that's what I would say um, for any, that, that we ourselves, we are the possible. We're the ones that we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, so what I'm hearing is, first of all, we need to demand a seat. Um, but also, you know, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. So start with yourself, start in your own circle of influence um, and start somewhere. Uh, thank you for that. Tiasa, there's a question here for you uh, that says, you and climate activist Greta have similar ethics by manifesting things that you demand, which is marvelous. Do you see her as an inspiration? Um, thank you so much for this question. I think, yes, uh, for sure. She is, she, she, I, I'm so inspired by her because she says, back to um, not asking for permission, I'm telling you that climate change is a thing that we need to be talking about. We can no longer just ignore it. Um, and I think I have, I've, I've taken, I've taken a lot of insight from her in times, in terms of saying that even though I'm young, because I mean, there have been points and moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, just like what Ida had said earlier, like I'm too young to be talking like, like I own the place, but taking ownership and being like, these are important things that we need to talk about. These are important things that we need to focus on as, like, as the as government and as people um, from the continent. So yes, definitely, she is very inspiring. And just as the fact that she is a woman in such an amazing space like uh, climate change and the sector of climate change and the environment is is also very admirable because I'm um, like we're in this together as as women. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Tiasa. Very true. Uh, here's a question that made me laugh, but I, <laughs> I'll ask it to Ida. Um, it says, welcome to Africa, where most of our presidents are in their late 60s and in their 70s. And we have people holding public office who in real life have retired, but on paper have not. The old isn't ready to leave for the young to take over. How do we deal with this? <laughs> a very timely question and, and one that's very um, pertinent to our reality as African. As you were reading the question, one, one quote came to life, came, came, came to my mind, and it was, um, power concedes nothing without a force. Uh, and I'm not saying by that that we as young people should be on the street and burning everything, uh, but uh, what I'm saying is that it, uh, through that is that our old presidents won't leave until we hold them accountable to leaving. There was actually someone who said, um, sometimes we get the leaders that we deserve. And, 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 at, and, 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 and you know, it, it's, it's a problematic code, but I think there's something true in that, in the, real, in the reality of that when these people are in power, it's because there are some certain forces that are keeping them where they are, right? Mm -hmm. And they also know how to play with the, people enough like whether it's through like you know um ethnic divisions whether it's through some of the class divisions whatever social realities that we have in our continent such that we're divided enough as people that they can still stay in power because there is a huge portion of the population who still support them um i think for me when it comes to leadership change in the continent we need more consciousness we need to know our history and we need to understand as well who 
why is what is happening happening? Why is it that some people can stay in power for 40 years? Why is it that some presidents are not even well uh, and are in the hospital but still leading? So what is it that's acting? And and really start to rally and have a plan and have a plan because they will not go on their own. We, we will have to, to kick them out. Mm, mm, sure. You can see me and Eddie are just nodding and saying yes. Um, clearly, it's a place of contention for us as well. Uh, thank you, Ida, for that response. Um, another one that um, I think we should definitely ha take a stab at us answering is uh, going to Eddie. It says, the victims of the scourge inflicted by society, like racism, um, are now retaliating a bit too late. It seems people react only when things get serious. An example, George Floyd, the way the police handled him before killing him ruthlessly in public was in itself wrong. Was Yes, he was suspected, but that is not a reason enough to put a knee on a person's neck like that. Minorities are now conditioned to these inhumane acts that now only the worst causes, that cause uh, worse reactions. Eddie, um, what would you say, ooh, the question then disappeared. What would you suggest should be the speed and type of response um, to nullify this growing problem? Um, well, there was, there was a lot in that question and, and I'm going to try my best to try and, and grapple with it. I, I suppose the first thing um, I would want people to know is that the movement for Black Lives didn't begin with the murder of George Floyd or the murder of Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Aubrey, that the Black Lives Matter has actually been campaigning on the ground persistently um, for a very, very long time. And uh, there are many avenues where Black people on a daily basis advocate um, for justice and equality, um, unbeknownst to the glare of the camera. Um, and so I think it's important to know that this is not a new battle, that Black Lives Matter actually picked up where um, civil rights icons left, right? Like, this has been an ongoing struggle and, and is deeply entrenched and it's deeply enrooted in centuries um, of resistance um, by Black people. And so um, I, I wouldn't want people to walk away with the impression that somehow Black Lives Matter just began. Um, I think what is particularly outrageous is the fact that um, this what we what we what we all bore witness to actually was not uh, somebody that just acted in isolation. This is a systemic issue. Um, the way that uh, you know law enforcement officers feel confident and brazen enough to uh, kill and lynch somebody with the eyes of the world watching tells you that there is a systemic, there's an institutional problem. So this isn't a question of individual people. This is a question of a system that produces and allows um, for law enforcement officers to feel as though they can get away uh, with something as, as, as heinous and as, 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 as despicable as what we all bore witness to. Um, and so I think that you know, in our own lives, when we advocate and when we fight for issues of equality and injustice, we must recognize that we're part of a tradition uh, there are people that came before us and there are people that will come after us um, and that our role, um, you know, um, there's a quote that I think about Franz Fanon, that each generation um, has its own burden to bear and either we fulfill it or we betray it, right? Um, this is one that, 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 that you know, uh, Ida reminded me of recently. And so um, I think that's really what it is. I think that this is a moment where we need to fulfill um, the obligation that we have as this generation to fight for for equality. Thank you, Eddie. And I, I so agree with what you just 
connected. And I know that on a personal level, I am also at that place where I'm like, what is my role um, as Amanda? And what do I need to do to uh, move the needle even just a little bit um, in my time? So I think that it is definitely something that we all need to be um, conscious about. Maybe before I even move away from you, Eddie, um, let me ask you this question because it's quite personal to you. Um, it says, Eddie, for a young African with disabilities looking to apply to ALA, was the campus user friendly and accommodating to your needs? Pretty much. Well, I, I think the first thing for me to say is that with every barrier of inaccessibility that disabled people break down, we encounter more and more inaccessibility. So um, that is to say that there is never enough access. There's never a cap um, on our desire to live lives that are full um, and dignified. And so I will say that the ALA campus at the time was accessible, but I think that it took people making it work. And there were cases when it wasn't accessible, um, but I think it's not, the fear of it being inaccessible should not stop policymakers from trying to make it work, from trying to work in collaboration with disabled people um, to really open up the space. Um, and again, what I will say finally is that um, a ramp does not make a space accessible. What makes a space accessible is the connection, the freedom, and the possibility that that space engenders for people to come together. So mm -hmm. accessibility should be a revolutionary and radical concept that we are perpetually working towards. The journey is never done. The journey is never done. Um, thank you so much for that, um, Eddie. And I think it just calls for more institutions to think about how, you know, we do actually think about accessibility over and beyond, um, you know, a ramp, like you mentioned, uh, but just, yeah, thinking beyond that. So thanks for answering that. Um, I will move on to Ida um, and ask this question. Um, it says that seeing that most important decisions um, engaging the people are taken by political leaders. Is it not time for young Africans to embrace careers which can help make a lot make lobbying um, so that it influences decision making? So I, essentially, I think this question is saying, isn't it time for young people to take up careers in this space? Um, you know my answer to that? Absolutely. I completely believe so. I, um, like a bit about my story was I, it, it was through leading a student government at, at school that I, I just realized, and, and perhaps it's been obvious, but for me, that, there was that personal rec recognition that for us to be able to make a sustainable change, so just not, you know, a band-aid so, uh, uh, solution to massive structural problem, we need to be sitting in those governmental institutions and we need to be uh, there to actually create those policies and practices that would, mel that would make accessibility a reality, that would make the conservation of our wildlife a reality in the continent, right? Uh, and, the, and the reality for that is that if we want that to happen, it's, we have to be at the table. I think if we take the example of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the protests have been amazing at the at creating this global reckoning and also at forcing people to be thinking through what are some of the policies that we need to be implementing to ensure that um, Black men or Black trans people are not being killed uh, uh, unjustly in the US and actually even in Africa, black people are being killed in a way that's quite unjust. Uh, but then the next step of that is actually sitting at the table and drafting those policies. That work is not as sexy as being on Twitter and, and sharing hashtag. It actually requires sitting down and going through very sparse and dense papers and managing various interests from business, from the business who are financing the police, from the activists who want a more radical change to all also the, your, your everyday person who, are, who, who honestly just want the protest to stop, right? So, and it's, and it's that, and, and honestly, I think young people should be there. I know as well that when we think about 
political careers and careers as politician, it has a very bad name because we all have this idea of these corrupt political leaders. And sometimes as young people, we, we want to shy away from it, right? Uh, what I will say is that um, since the team is actually redefining expectation, it's actually the moment to redefine what is what, that, what does it mean to be a politician and to go back to the core of the, uh, the core meaning of that work, which is around really advocating for specific policy changes. Uh, and so for me, to any young people who want to make change, I would say explore working in the public sector, explore becoming a civil servant. It's not easy, it's hard, but knowing that you can have influence on those policies will ensure that changes happen. Thank you so much for that, um, Ida. I definitely echo that same sentiment. Uh, as young people, I do believe that if we want the change, we may have to actually go and roll up our sleeves and go do the work ourselves. Um, definitely something that I have been also challenged to do. And um, I think you're totally right on that. Um, Tiasa, uh, here's a question for you that says, um, I understand that your focus is young people, but do you think the change you want to see can can be realized without older generation? And if so, how would you go about getting them more aware and getting them involved as well? Mm -hmm. Wow, I like that question. Um, okay, when I talk, when I talk about owning our spaces, I'm I definitely we're not gonna push the old people aside. Sorry to call you old people, but they are old people, but pushing the old people aside, it's um creating the spaces where we are both able to collaborate as the older generation and the young generation, because definitely we can um, take um, advice from them and what they've done, what they've succeeded in different ideas. How can we improve what they've already done in, in for example, the wildlife sector? Um, but I think focusing on young people and using, because we take 70% of the African population, yes. And so by, through that, we are the majority, we are the voice, we are a majority of the voice. And so by, through creating awareness to the older generation, it's, it's coming together with one shared voice and talking about, I mean, in, in 1960, when we had 5 million elephants, what were you doing then? Okay, we have 200 lions. Now, what are we going to do? Um, how can we get to those numbers? What policies? or in place then that are not in place now. Focusing on um, creating spaces where I, I, I don't think that for, uh, where was I going? I've lost my thought, I've lost my train of thought. But <laughs> um, just understanding that these, these, by educating young people like us, we are going, I go home and I tell my mom, mom, did you know that lions are cool <laughs> and she'd be like yeah and she'll have it in her workspace talk about it and and i have thought of different ideas for example one of the ideas is um using companies that have logos on their on their companies that have animals on their logos what are they doing towards conserving that animal and so that's having conversations in that workspace in that in 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 um cement companies talking about okay we have simba cement which is a lion what are we doing to to conserve that elephant and that that's that's having conversations in those older generation spaces um and yeah and also i think there's also time for the older generation to just sit back and listen to what we have to say at the same time it's, it's important Mm, mm, very true. And they do need to be put into the fold. Thank you so much, uh, Tiasa, for that. Um, I have only three questions that I can probably ask at this point. Let me bucket two together and ask them to Eddie. Um, one says, do education, education systems impact how young people practice advocacy? And could they be failing on that part? And the second one says, um, is advocacy something that you can teach or is it dependent on the socioeconomic conditions that push that young person to take initiative? Well, I think um, like all advocates, I think that our advocacy is informed by our lived experience, right? So advocacy is something that you feel when you feel excluded or you feel like you're not part of a conversation that motivates you to become an activist or an advocate. 
Um, I also think that advocacy is the work of the imagination. It's about envisioning and creating a world that doesn't yet exist. So it's actually a creative project. It's a creative enterprise. Um, and so that can be, can be taught. It's about critical thinking. And I think another word for activism or advocacy is empathy. It's about feeling deeply for strangers you don't know. It's about really just connecting and feeling um, outraged, unvarnished outraged by uh, inequality or injustice. And so I think it, it, it really is about feeling and it's about uh, the imagination and being able to creatively um, ethical visioning, envisioning a better world, but one that doesn't exist right now. Oh, thank you, Eddie, for that. Um, <laughs> So, so true. Wow. Um, Ida, let me ask you the last question before we wrap up. Um, this one says, for places where the lockdown is not lifted, jobs are threatened, and the rate of theft, theft and robbery is increasing, what would be your advice to the governments on how to handle the cases, knowing fully well that the pandemic is not yet over? Uh, just to make sure I understand the question. So the question, there's a lot in there. So, so, so the question is around uh, the places that are still under lockdown and the fact that there, there, there's increased crime, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, it's a good question. And it's, it's a question that speaks, again, a lot of the tensions of policy makings that are really around the trade-offs that governments have to make regarding whether um, they have to maintain a full lockdown, which will definitely, as we know, um, reduce the spread of the disease, but also we know that the economic reality of many Africans is that they are working in the informal sector, like they get their, uh, their, um, their mean subsidence by their day job, right? If they don't go to work, there's no savings, so they, they, and they might starve, and, and so that, that might explain why we're also seeing a rise in crime, etc. What I will say is that, um, policy has to be contextualized, they have to be localized, and they have to be tailored. There can't be uh, a blanket um, full lockdown because the UK has done a full lockdown, then let's do that, or France has done a full lockdown, let's do that. I think uh, what governments are thinking, and I think many countries actually have done well, is really thinking through what makes sense in my country. So it might be that you can't do a really a full lockdown. So what you will have to do is perhaps have a curfew. What you will have to do is also making sure that there is um, that the people understand as well the risk re regarding the diseases and making sure that there are some um, safety nets, right? Because because when you talk about crimes, uh, especially when it comes to, to the context of lockdown, it might be that just that people actually don't have anything to eat. So they, 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 they resort to, to, to theft to try to find something to eat. And then, then that speaks very much about also policy making with empathy, right? So what are we doing for those people that don't have anything to eat? And how can we implement policies, whether it's basic income or whether it's... Um, some sort of uh, grant that they receive to be able to feed their family because you can't just, uh, in the context of Africa and even across the world, you can't just impose a full lockdown without some sort of social safety net. So that's the one thing I would say. The second bit I would say, and, and I will end there, is that it's just important as well for, for both us to give feedback to government regarding those policies and also to government to, to listen to, 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 to the population and what the population demands, especially when it comes um, to a situation like COVID where we ultimately don't know when the disease is ending. And so in many ways, we have to learn to live with it. Thank you, Ida. Uh, so, so true. Um, leading with empathy. And I think that the pandemic has definitely shown us that there's so many um, inequalities in our societies that we really need to factor uh, for and uh, think about how we lead and make policies that really are inclusive, right? Um, so thank you for that. Uh, time has left us. Um, and I think it's just a showcase of how interesting this conversation was. Um, we needed more time, but we don't. So I will ask each panelist in one sentence, not more than that, to tell us what their vision is for good governance in Africa. Eddie, start. My vision is let us amplify the voices of those who are furthest behind the line of opportunity. Mm, okay, okay. Ida. 
Um, my vision is let us build an Africa that is economically and socially independent. Wow. Yes, sir. Um, changing the mindset that young people cannot make change and, and being inclusive. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Whew. Well, thank you, um, Eddie, Ida, Tiasa. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, and thank you to everyone who listened in um, this evening. Uh, we have come to the end of our conversation um, and would love, love, love to continue the conversation offline. Clearly, there was a lot um, to talk about, but thank you for this. Um, look out for our next uh, webinar, which is going to be in two weeks, and it will be looking at the future of education and we have some amazing panelists for that session particularly so i um, recommend that you register if you have not registered yet you'll you'll get uh, information on how to register um, that is it from me um, thank you everyone and have a good evening um, goodbye